Well, this evening, if you'll take your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter number 13, excuse me, chapter number 12. I was looking down the page a little bit, but 2 Samuel chapter number 12, and I'm going to read from verse number 26 down to the end of this chapter, uh, verse number 31. So as you follow along with your eyes, just uh, let me... Uh, read this once you've found your place. Second Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse number 26. <clears throat> the Bible says, And Joab fought against Reba of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and have taken the city. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it lest I take the city, and it be called after my name. And David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he took their king's crown from off his head, the weight whereof was a talent of gold with the precious stones, and it was set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he brought forth the people that were therein and put them under saws and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron and made them pass through the brick kiln. And thus did he unto all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all the people returned unto Jerusalem. What we've read here in this passage of scripture is the account of the conquest of the city of Rabbah uh, which incidentally corresponds to the city of Amman, Jordan, the capital of the modern state of Jordan, and uh, the conquest of Rabbah and the conquest of the Ammonites. The Ammonites were a, a people that were distantly related, of course, to Israel. But you know, Israel's wars with the Ammonites actually dates back to the days of the judges. Uh, when Israel had turned away from the Lord, uh, you're familiar with the fact that uh, the Lord allowed these uh, nations to come out against uh, the Israelites and put them into bondage until they came to the place where they would uh, ca call out to the Lord and so forth. And in that mix, there were the Ammonites. And uh, they continued through into the days of King Saul, but David's war with the Ammonites actually began in chapter 10 of Second Samuel. And what had happened was that there was a new king, the son of the old king. The old king was a warlike king, but a new uh, a king came to the throne and David decided that he would uh, show kindness to King Hunan. And he did. And he sent ambassadors there and, uh, and tried to be an encouragement to this king, but David's good intentions toward King Hunan were undermined by the princes of Ammon. In fact, we read in verse 3 of 2 Samuel 10, And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanun, their Lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city, and to spy it out, and to overthrow it? Uh, so they uh, raised up some real suspicion there, and what happened was that Hunan the king, the new king, humiliated David's servants and sent them back and uh, knowing that this would no doubt provoke a war with, uh, with Israel and with, uh, with David, they uh, hired Syrian mercenaries to uh, bolster their own forces. Well, we read on from there that David and his great general, General Joab, won convincing victories against the Syrians who had come, had been hired to help, and, and uh, once that happened and the Syrians fled and were defeated again, uh, then uh, the, uh, uh, David mobilized his army under, King jo uh, under General Joab against the Ammonites. And what we see here in this uh, portion of scripture is that Rabbah was besieged, and this passage of scripture describes for us the final triumph, and uh, it was a great victory. Well, what I'd like us to look at for a few moments this evening is really the two main characters in this account, and that would be General Joab and King David. 
And the message I'd like us to think about tonight uh, is simply to consider the response of each man to the victory that was won on that day. Because there was a great difference in the way Joab responded to the victory against the Ammonites and the way that David responded. And uh, it's very, very interesting to look back and, and to see. First of all, Joab, when the victory was, was won, and he says there in verse uh, 28 that he had taken the city of waters, and uh, instead of finishing it off, he stepped aside to allow David to come in and execute the coup de grace, so to speak, and to finish the Ammonites off, and it would be David who would ride triumphantly into the city as the victor. Joab had done all the work, you understand, but he allowed his king, David, to, to be the one to get the glory. And I find that very interesting, and I want to talk about that. But also, we see that David had a different reaction. First of all, we see in verse 31 that he wreaked severe retribution upon those that were conquered. Uh, it says there he brought forth the people that were therein and put them under saws and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron and made them pass through the brick kiln. And thus he did unto all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. So what David did was really, really quite, uh, quite horrific. I mean, he just brutalized the people, um, uh, cut them up under saws and harrows, tore their flesh to strips and burnt them through the brick kiln. I mean, he just uh, had a, a totally different uh, response to this great victory. And so for a few moments, I just want to look at these responses and to draw some spiritual application uh, that we can apply to our own lives. And first of all, we want to look at Joab's response. And as I mentioned, he displayed true loyalty and humility. When you think about it, he was a great general. He was well respected. Everybody loved him. David looked to him. And he had just led his troops against uh, Rabbah, this, this chief city of the Ammonites, and he had defeated them. And yet he was willing to step aside and to allow David to receive the glory uh, instead of himself. In fact, I like those words there in verse 28. And the latter part of that, he said, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. What he was saying is, don't, don't call it after me. Uh, I don't want to be the one to get the glory here. I want the glory to go to my king. And I think you can begin to see a spiritual application for you and I who are serving the king of kings, right? That uh, as Christians, our uh, desire should be and our, our task really is to, to give all the glory to the king and not to take the glory for ourselves. And what uh, Joab did here was what we would refer to as the principle of de deflecting praise. Defle deflecting praise. And that's something that as Christians we need to learn to do because many times in serving the Lord, doing things here around the church, people are going to come and say, what a great job. You are just perfect in that job. And, and, and I know I am, but uh, you don't have... No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> But uh, you understand that uh, we, we, we give praise and we accept praise and, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, that to a certain degree, but the problem is that human nature is going to exalt self if it, give, if it has the opportunity. Uh, here, Joab, being the great general, uh, and knowing that David's tenure there as the king was still being established, what a great opportunity for him to promote himself and who knows where that could lead. But instead he, he gave David the, the, the uh, kudos for, for this great victory. Uh, but there is that tendency, even in our own lives, if we're not careful, to accept the praise and then allow it to well up inside to where we can actually believe that we are really good at what we do. And we fail to give God the glory. Uh, in fact, the Bible teaches that. In Proverbs 20, verse 6, the Bible says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. That is a natural tendency. I mean, it's kind of unnatural for us to walk around saying, oh, I'm terrible. Oh, you don't want to know me. I'm, I'm just bad. I mean, we, we want to put on a good front. And 
that's human nature. We, we will want to proclaim our own goodness. The, the proverb goes on to say, but a faithful man who can find. And there are many examples we could go to. I'm just going to read here. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 6, we have uh, uh, an example of the Pharisees. And Jesus here is uh, comparing and contrasting how you and I should be in our life uh, and not to be like a Pharisee because what were they doing? They were doing everything to be seen of men. I mean, other scriptures say they loved the chief uh, uppermost seats at the feast. They wanted to be in the public eye. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, uh, that uh, they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest arms, let not thy right hand know what thy left do, left uh, excuse me uh, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That, excuse me, that thine arms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter uh, into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, it's important to notice that in that passage of Scripture, the Lord is not condemning the Pharisees for praying. He's not condemning them for being generous and giving to the needs of others. What he is pointing out is that they do it for the purpose of being seen of men. They want people to notice them. And as I said, this really is uh, indicative of human nature. But a true servant, a true servant of God, will always seek the success and the honour of others. Uh, An example of that, I think, is best seen. Uh, We could see it in the Lord Jesus Christ who uh, deferred praise to the Heavenly Father, his Father, but think of the Apostle Paul for a moment. Uh, Paul was the the great preacher, a great theologian, a church planter. God used him in so many ways. Uh, We tend to put Paul up there as one of the heroes of the Christian faith, and rightly so. But you know, Paul would always defer any praise that came his way. Uh, Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, we've covered this scripture fairly recently in, uh, in uh, the context of, of how God uses us, but notice that uh, there was a problem in the church at Corinth because people were following after these human leaders. They were glorying in Paul, they were glorying in Apollos or Peter as it was. And Paul sets them straight here in verse number 5 where he says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers or servants by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Uh, He said, we're not special. God has blessed every man with the abilities that they need to serve God. And uh, we're we're not special. He said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And that's a great illustration because, you know, if you just go out and plant seed and say, okay, I've planted my my uh, spring crop of vegetables and that's all you do uh, they're probably not going to grow if they do it won't be very well because they need to be watered and weeded okay along the way to help them grow and uh, Paul said well I did the seed planting but Apollos came along he watered but you know ultimately even with uh, with uh, uh, plants in the ground you need God's blessing don't you and it's God who gives the increase I used to teach my children when they were gardening. I said, what, what do you need? Well, you need, you, need, uh, you need the seed, you need the soil, you need the sunshine, you need the, the water, and you need God's blessing because it doesn't happen without God. And uh, so it is. Paul points that out in the Christian life. In verse 7, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And so Paul... Uh, I'm sure there were followers there in the church at Corinth that when he showed up, they were just 
oh, they were, they were just uh, praising him and, and, uh, and wanting to, to, to put him on their shoulders and carry him through the, the center aisle of the church and set him in a prominent place. But Paul deflected that praise and gave it all to the Lord. A very good principle for us. And, uh, you know, the psalmist, uh, and David wrote this, by the way, I think he he wrote it later on in life, but in Psalm 115, verse 1, he wrote these words, listen to them. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. And David came to realize, you know, it's not about David. It's not about exalting me. It's about exalting the Lord. We're thinking of the Apostle Paul not only giving God the glory, but, you know, I find that with all of his team members, uh, the men and and even the women that worked with him and helped him, uh, when he refers to them, he never demeans them. He doesn't say, well, I'm the big shot here. I'm the the, uh, chief preacher and all of you working for me and you'll do what I say. Yeah, he referred to them as his fellows, as his fellow workers, fellow laborers. And Paul knew that anything that was accomplished for the glory of God wasn't just because of his efforts, it was because of those that worked with him. And he was willing to share that praise with others. And that's how it is in the Christian, in the line of Christian ministry. I mean, no one person can do everything that's needed here in this church. We all depend upon one another. And this was the lesson we saw last month when we uh, focused our studies a little bit on the, on the subject of spiritual gifts. Paul recognized the source of his accomplishments. While you're there in 1 Corinthians 3, look over to chapter 4. And uh, Paul here is again taking up this subject of of, uh, who we really are. He says, uh, let a man so account of us as of the stewards of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's all God wants from us is to be faithful in what? We are doing for him. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, And then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn not to think of men above, uh, think of, uh, learning us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not? receive now if thou didst receive it why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it those are pretty strong words but they're to the point and uh, this is true service it's certainly a pers- uh, a, a an important attitude when it comes to spiritual gifts we read this in romans chapter 12 verse number three says for i say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly according as God has, hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So recognizing others and deflecting praise goes a long way and keeps us humble. And that's important in the home too. Uh, we mentioned on Sunday morning that, you know, a husband recognizes that his success in life is a large amount of that's due to his wife and he'll say so. In fact, I was looking again in Proverbs 31. That's the Proverbs 31 woman. And there are 22 verses in that passage of scripture that uh, talk about the virtuous woman. Do you realize that 14 out of 22 verses begins with the word she, followed by what she does? <laughs> and our wives and our ladies do a lot. And the Bible Uh, here is is, is listing all of these things that she does and the sacrifices she makes. And then we read in verse uh, 28 of Proverbs 31, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. That's deflecting praise because we know that her husband 
is described as a great man in the city. He sat at the gate. That was a place of prominence. I mean, he was a, a big wig around town. And it would have been easy for the husband of the virtuous woman to strut about and say, well, look at me and look at my home and everything I've accomplished, building himself up. But he praised his wife because he knew without her, he, he wouldn't be able to do anything. And that's a good attitude to have. You know, it's important for us to rejoice with others in what God has done through them. Uh, there can be no spirit of competition in the Lord's work, trying to outdo one another to get the, the praise of men. Uh, I like what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 says. Paul says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ Jesus. You see, the problem in the Corinthian church was that... Uh, they were comparing spiritual gifts and they had, uh, they'd put a numerical value on the various spiritual gifts and some of them were saying, well, <laughs> that's not much of a gift and look at my gift and they were puffing themselves up. Uh, we're not to do that. Paul said, I just thank God for the grace that he's given you. And most of you took part in a uh, kind of like a quiz or an analysis of spiritual gifts and hopefully by now you've kind of at least been told what it looks like and you can agree or not agree with that. You'll know your own self and praying about it, but you know you have a, a gift from God. He has endowed you with a spiritual gift. And you might say, oh, but I was hoping for this one. Well, too bad. He's given you that gift. And you know what? We ought to rejoice. Because God doesn't make mistakes and God sets the members in the body. And, uh, and, and so let's not get caught up in that. Uh, now we all like to receive a word of recognition. There's no doubt about that. And it's, it's, it's not uh, always a bad thing. I think we ought to recognize one another's accomplishments. But Proverbs 27 verse 2 puts it this way. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth. Uh, and, uh, and not thy, a stranger and not thine own lips. So when we go back and think about this Joab, this general, a great man in his own way, but he was a true servant. He, as a true servant, he gave his very best. He put everything into winning that battle, but he wasn't worried about who gets the credit. And ultimately, all credit must go to the king. Joab said, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. In Revelation chapter 4, that heavenly scene where we see the four and twenty elders there in heaven, who I believe are representative of the saints, Old and New Testament saints, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created those crowns would represent the rewards that would be given at the judgment seat of Christ and yet when we get to heaven and we've got our rewards the judgment seat of Christ is over and uh, those crowns you know we're not going to walk around heaven for all eternity wearing them like medals on our chest saying well look at me I got all five of them you only got one no they're there to give the glory to God and uh, that I see in uh, Joab's response to this victory he could have made something of it for his own self rightly so in in one sense but instead he stepped aside and let the king get the glory now I want to just talk about David's response to victory and I would describe his response as, first of all, being self-centered. Because in verse number 30, we're back in 2 Samuel chapter 12 now. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, in verse 30, uh, David took the king's crown from off his head, the weight whereof was a talent of gold. By the way, that's a lot of gold. Uh, it's said that a talent is like a, a, a heavy stone. That's how they kind of conjured up that word talent. Um, and this was a crown of gold set with precious stones and it was set on David's head. That was the first thing he did. 
It shows that his, his thinking wasn't, well, praise the Lord, we had a victory here. It's, wow, look at that gold crown, I want that. And maybe I'm reading into it a little bit, but I kind of see him as rather self-centered, and certainly in verse 31, he was very, very cruel to unleash that kind of a punishment upon the enemy. Now, I know in the, in the Bible, and really in all warfare, it's not a pretty thing, <laughs> and they were the victors. But it was a little over the top, I would say, to do what David did. And David did all of that, even though God was gracious to him. First in giving him the victory. This was a great victory. And yet, God showed grace to David, but David didn't show any grace to the enemy. And when I was thinking about this and thinking, well, why was that the case? I think we have to go back and consider the context of these events. I want you to look back at chapter 11, if you would. We're in chapter 12 here, which describes the, the culmination of the battle and, and this long siege that had been set against Rabbah, and finally the city was taken. But look at chapter 11, verse 1. This is, I think, a key to David's attitude. It came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. <laughs> Who's the king here? That's David. David, you're supposed to be in the battle. But what did he do? That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now, that is the beginning of this campaign. We don't know how long the city was under siege, probably for several months at least, but what happened? Well, you know the story. In verse 2 and down, David, who should have been with his general and with his troops in the battle, uh, was lounging on a rooftop in Jerusalem and saw Bathsheba, lusted after her, uh, committed adultery with her, and what is it, as worse, <laughs> as bad, I should say, was had her husband murdered. In fact, he sent Uriah the Hittite, her husband, back to the battle with a letter which was a death warrant instructing Joab, the general, to put him in the heat of the battle and make sure he doesn't come back, make sure he's killed in action. What a terrible thing because that sin of David. Now, the events that we read here in chapter 12 uh, with the taking of the city, I think chronologically... Uh, took place actually before um, uh, the birth of Bathsheba's child. After all, that would take nine months of time. And, and uh, I think that David had committed adultery. Uh, he'd seen to the death of Uriah. Uh, maybe uh, Bathsheba was, was uh, mourning the loss of her husband before he took her to be wife. Um, but uh, this battle had taken place. But you see... Uh, David's heart was not soft at this point of time. That's what I'm trying to get across. There was no humility in him. Um, he, uh, uh, he, he committed some terrible sins and he thought he got away with it. But you know, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And it was affecting him. You see, sin will always affect in more ways than we can think. And I believe it affected David's attitude and his demeanor in this battle uh, and the aftermath. Uh, I see David really as a picture of a Christian man because he certainly was a man after God's own heart. Uh, David is a saved man, but I see him as like a Christian who's out of God's will. Because instead of taking the crown of the king of Ammon and putting it on his head for his glory, what he should have done is cast that crown at the feet of the Lord, right? He should have said, God gets the glory. But oh no, because he's out of God's will, it's all about David. And beloved, when we're out of God's will, that's how we begin to act. We start thinking of ourselves and, and uh, taking advantage of others and the situation and so forth. And uh, that's what David was doing. Instead of reflecting on what uh, God's great mercy in his life, by showing mercy, he was merciless. 
Later on, David wrote Psalm 101, and the first three verses read this, I will sing of mercy and judgment. Well, that was obviously after the fact, wasn't it? Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within mine house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now, there's something doesn't add up there. That, that psalm is the psalm of a godly man. But David's actions are the actions of a self-centered man. And the reason is because of his sin that was there and maybe no one else saw it, but uh, I think Joab knew. <laughs> and to me, that's the unfinished story. I haven't thought, finished thinking about that. What was going through Joab's mind through all of this? Because he knew exactly what was going on. But, you know, I, I sometimes think that a Christian who's out of God's will or a Christian who's hiding sin, unconfessed sin in his or her life, they can act in a manner worse than an unsaved man at times. That's the, that's the truth. And David, in 2 Samuel 12, is certainly fighting against himself and the Lord. Remember when Nathan, the prophet, came to him and uh, confronted David with that sin, and he, used, he confronted him by means of a parable. And the parable was about a man who had plenty of sheep, but he went and took a, a poor man's sheep and cooked that instead. And the, what was David's attitude there? He didn't laugh and say, oh, that's a great story. The Bible says he was angry. He got really steamed up about that. And, uh, uh, you know, he was angry with the man in Nathan's parable, <laughs> but he wasn't angry with himself, at least not until that finger went out and said, thou art the man. And, you know, God touched his heart and praised the Lord for forgiveness and reconciliation and and all that God did in David's life. But, uh, you know, we, I've seen sometimes, and maybe in my own life at times, when you're not right with God, you become very critical of others. You start looking at others and saying, oh, what are they doing wrong? And look at them. And a lot of times it's just a cloak to cover up what's going on in our own life. Now, I'm not saying that's in every case, but I see that here with David. He came after that victory and... It was all about his glory and it was all about him showing no mercy. I'm going to show these people, you don't mess with me. And yet he himself found many times over that God was gracious to him. God was merciful to him. But when you're out of God's will, you don't always see things the way that God would have us see it. And, and uh, you know, David later learned this truth, I'm, I'm sure, because in Psalm 103 verse 10, this is what David wrote. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. By the way, that's a great definition of mercy, isn't it? He hath not. Grace is the other. He has. <laughs> Grace is God giving us things we don't deserve, but mercy is not giving us what we do deserve. David knew the mercy of God, but at this time in his life it was lacking. And sadly, David would reap what he had sown. He'd repay uh, for his sin in the fourfold, fourfold, as he said, that man will pay back fourfold. <laughs> well, you're the man. And uh, the tragic end of four of his children. 2 Samuel 12, 6 talks about that. And his days from then on would now be filled with warfare. Uh, 2 Samuel 12, 10. And God said, David, there's some things you're not going to get to do because there's too much blood in, on your sword because of his barbarity here. Sin will always have consequences. Even when we are forgiven, sometimes those consequences are going to have an impact in our life. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 2, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. We need to be careful and understand that God's, the victories that we win are not because of us, they're because of the grace of God, the goodness of God. That's what grace is, the, uh, the goodwill that God extends to us. We don't deserve it, but God gives it to us. 
And so we should live our life and strive to live our life for God's glory, to please him. And when there is praise that's heaped upon us, well, it's nice to receive, but you know what? We should defer that praise to others that have had a part. Don't take it all to yourself because no man lives to himself. And uh, we're dependent upon each other in our ministries and even in the workplace. It's, it's a, a, just a, a matter of fact that if you, if you want to advance in the workplace, then do all you can to advance the one who's over you. Uh, it kind of works that way, doesn't it? Well, deferring praise, we see that in Joab, and uh, I think there's a great contrast there with he and David. Something to, I'll throw out, you can think about it. Don't call me, don't email me. <laughs> but what must have been going through Joab's mind in all of this, because he knew what David was doing in the matter of Uriah. Uh, if, you, if you look at 2 Samuel 11, verses 18 through 21, uh, Joab was well aware of David's plot. And he could have used that against David. He could, have, he could have exposed David. He could have had his way. It's an amazing thing that Joab still was willing to step back and say, okay, David, you finish it off. You get the glory. That is a man of great humility. And uh, may the Lord help us to be men and women of humility and understanding that all the praise belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ.